I think you guys have a pretty good understanding of what niche means. And you know a little bit about tolerance curves. So when you looked at things like the steelhead, the steelhead does not do well when conditions change. So here's the thing. We can categorize organisms based on how tolerant they are of changing conditions. And this, this, huh, easy for me to say, this gets us to the term generalist and specialist. So generalists are organisms that have a really wide niche. Generalists do okay when conditions change. Generalists are organisms that do really well under a wide variety of conditions. Can you think, so right now, don't yell it out, talk to the people at your table, name a couple species that you suspect are generalists. We have things like dandelions. What, what do people call this? A weed. weed. They call it a weed. And generalists, so they call this a weed. Now, I have an argument with that because I think a weed is just a plant nobody loves, and I love these. They're, they're fantastic ecologically. These are an early source of pollen for bees. Those bees are coming out of the winter, and they're hungry. There hasn't been pollen available to them for months. And these are one of the first things that sticks their cheery, bright little heads up. And by God, they bloom. And that is a really important food source for those pollinators who've been starving to death all winter. You haven't seen food in three months? Awesome! So there's that, and we can eat them. And they're, you know, the greens are great, and the rabbits love them, and the deer love them, and all kinds of herbivores love them. So, okay, but we call them a weed species. Well, here's the funny thing. Generalists often get called weed species. Yeah, they, you know, they thrive anywhere. They can tolerate a wide variety of conditions. That place that nobody else really likes, they'll, they'll grow there. I heard somebody say dog, and then somebody else said, that doesn't count. That's a domestic species. That's not a wild animal. It can be. And that, in fact, is a wild dog. It's a street dog. It's a dog that's gone feral. Um, so this is multi-generations out from being somebody's pet. This dog has never lived in somebody's house. This dog hasn't even lived on the end of a chain tied to a house. Um, this dog doesn't deal with humans on a normal basis except to probably run from them or steal food. Um, what can dogs eat? Anything. Pretty much anything. My dog will eat carrots. My dog will eat all kinds of vegetables that fall on the, pretty much anything that falls on the floor in the kitchen. Um, she, she will also eat um, any scrap of meat, obviously, that falls on the floor. Bones, sure. Um, dig stuff out of the compost, absolutely. Dogs love trash. Dogs love... Ew, don't get me started on baby diapers. Um, yeah, they like cat poop. My God, they'll eat anything. By definition, that's a generalist. My, my dog has a really weird coat. Um, we actually did finally get her DNA tested. It was a Christmas present to my in-laws. We found out she is one-eighth Aussie. She is one-eighth Collie. She is one-quarter Golden Retriever, one-quarter Standard Poodle, and one-eighth is so mixed up they can't even tell what it is. They just say, probably a herding breed. Okay. Um, when we got her, she had been a stray who was then rescued by a dog hoarder, and she was living in a makeshift pen in the woods over winter for four months. This woman made pens out of, like, old cars and parts and gates and then saved dogs. She was crazy. And anyway, she, the dog ended up at a rescue, and she lives in a house now. And, you know, when we got her, she had this amazing, thick, long, bushy coat. And I was like, wow, that's pretty. And within about a month of us having her and her living in the house full time, um, I had not one dog, but two dogs. One was walking around on four feet, and one was like scurrying around the floor because she had shed her entire coat, and I could have knitted another dog out of what was like laying on my floor, and I was vacuuming three times a day. She's adaptable. When she was living outside in winter conditions, she had a bomb coat. Oh my God, it was thick. Like you couldn't get your fingers all the way through her coat down to her skin. Couldn't do it. It was so bushy. 
And at that point, I thought, maybe she's a husky. No, she's been living out in the cold for months. Now that she lives in the house, she's got a much thinner coat. Even in the winter, she still puts on a winter coat. Um, we still have the spring shed where there's fur all over the house. But they're adaptable. Dogs are a fantastic generalist. Did anybody see a weed species? I can put in another human. Where are weed species? Where do humans live? Every continent except Antarctica permanently. There are humans living in the Arctic. There are humans living in the tropics. Have our bodies adapted? Some. But for the most part, we have behavioral adaptations. You want to go live in cold climates? We'll figure out how to build a shelter. You want to live in cold climates? We'll figure out how to make um, clothing out of fur and wool. You want to go live in a desert? We'll figure out how to live underground. There's a human. There. She can be representative of our entire species for now. So, okay. Humans are a weed species. We are generalists. We are fantastically adaptable. We have a wide niche. <laughs> niche. So, um, somebody else mentioned carp. Carp, of which I do not have a picture, would be another generalist species. We talked about steelheads. They don't do well when conditions change. They don't do well when oxygen levels drop. Carp do just fine. So, what's the opposite of a generalist? Specialist. So, at your table, name me a specialist species. Penguin it, penguins are a specialist species, yes. It's a and, and by the way, penguin is not a species. There's chinstrap penguin, emperor penguin. There are like 30 species of penguin, but most of those penguin species are pretty specialized. Um, what's this? It's a koala bear. It's adorable. Now, as cute and cuddly as they may look, I would like to draw your attention to these babies. Those are not claws, those are talons. Um, you go to hug a koala bear, it's going to rake you open. Um, it is not a cuddly, it's not a bear to cuddle. Yeah. Now, what do they eat? Do you know? Um, what? Eucalyptus. Eucalyptus. <laughs> they eat eucalyptus trees, leaves from eucalyptus trees. Who here has had um, Vicks Vapo Rub put on their chest? Wait, what? Who has had it makes it burn and sting and opens up your sinuses? Yeah. yeah. Guess what Vicks VapoRub is composed mostly of? Eucalyptus oil. Guess what koala bears smell like? They smell like Vicks VapoRub. They smell like eucalyptus. They only eat one thing. Guess where koala bears live? Australia, where that one thing grows. Could you bring a koala bear to Ohio and release it in the wild and expect it to survive and reproduce? No. No, because it would die. Keep because they, they can't eat anything else. They only eat eucalyptus. As a result, they have a very narrow range. Their tolerance for other foods is very narrow. Yes? I don't know. It's possible. Not something I'm familiar with. <clears throat> because they have a single food source, they are a specialist. I'm going to pause this. Who's in Here's my little panda, and they, we said they eat nothing but bamboo. So, panda, koala, we said steelhead. What's the problem with specialists? Talk at your table. What do you think is the big problem with being a specialist species? Okay, do you see the tan area here? That is the historic range of the giant panda. So giant pandas, we said, all they eat is bamboo, and they eat a lot of bamboo. That is where bamboo used to grow. Now, just like in this country, um, in China, humans have changed the environment significantly. And those mountains that used to be giant bamboo forests, a lot of them have been cut down. They've been you know, over-harvested. You face the same kind of things. Do you see the tiny little red dots there? Yeah. That's where giant pandas live now. Hmm. 
when the, when the habitat disappears, when the habitat changes, specialist species don't adapt very well. You see the exact same thing with what? No, I said the exact Oh, yeah. Yeah, when, when the world changes, they don't do very well. I mean, this is, so my, um, my brother-in-law is a very picky eater. He won't eat tomatoes. He won't eat, I don't even know what he doesn't eat. There's a whole list of things he doesn't eat. He doesn't eat anything spicy. Oh, I think he eats, like, potatoes spice. and meat. I love potatoes. And possibly, I'm not even sure salad is okay. Like, the lettuce is fine, but I think everything else is suspicious. No cucumbers, no olives, no tomatoes. No onions. Oh, yeah, he doesn't like, it's bizarre. So anyway, if you put him someplace where he cannot get exactly what he wants to eat, guess what he'll do? He just won't eat. Well, eventually. He'll, he, he, will, he has a driver's license and he's a grown-up, so he'll actually get in the car and go where there's food. But he's just really super picky. Now, there's no biological reason he can't eat tomatoes or chocolate cake. He won't eat chocolate cake. Um, he'll only eat vanilla cake. Wow, I gotta meet this guy. I, yeah. You would you would think he weighs like 103 pounds. No, he's actually you know a healthy looking chubby guy. He eats a lot of food. So, when somebody or some species is incredibly particular about their tolerances, either for physiological reasons like the hellbender, like the steelhead trout, or for I mean the pandas can't digest other stuff. This is what they eat. When the environment changes, these guys have a really hard time. Really hard time. All right, here's what we are going to do. That's it for the notes for this chapter.